Yeah, actually, you know, I think every single person here knows Mark and Ross as some of the most outspoken uh, commentators in Australian politics at the moment. We're delighted that they're joining us for Friedman at the Friedman Conference once again. I know that the feedback surveys we've filled out in previous Friedman conferences have had them as some of our most popular, most passionate um, speakers that everybody loves. You, whether or not uh, you might agree with them on everything, you might disagree with them, you can't doubt their courage, their, their conviction and their passion. So to invite, first of all, I think the former leader of the Australian Labor Party, the former leader of the, of the opposition, the former um, outsider, now the uh, running uh, Mark Latham's outsiders, Mark Latham. <laughs> So many formers in that, uh, I've got to spark up my act, haven't I? Get going again. Uh, I thought today uh, in my presentation I'd uh, try and answer a question that Ross reckons he's always harassed about. People come up to him and very often straight off the bat will say, this uh, bastard Latham you've been hanging around with, this former Labor leader, can you explain his political transition from leading the Australian Labor Party to speaking at things like a libertarian conference? And I've got to say, over the last uh, 36 hours uh, of being here, that, that seems to have been a question that many people have asked me as well. I suppose my immediate response is to say that former Labor leaders are doing all sorts of unexpected things <laughs> at the current time. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I had a call from an old parliamentary colleague who mentioned Kevin Rudd. You're supposed to laugh more when I mention Kevin Rudd. That's <laughs> Sort of the normal reaction uh, at a gathering like this, surely. But Kevin, you might recall, missed out on getting that position at the UN as the Secretary General. And it's a little known fact that he's actually back in his old seat of Griffith on the south side of Brisbane, rampaging through the seat as only Kevin can to try and make a parliamentary comeback. He's been through shopping centres, hospitals, <laughs> schools, and he was in a nursing home. He was in a nursing home earlier in the week. And he was going around big noting, taking selfies, doing all the things Kevin would do to gratify his massive ego. And um, a little old lady came up to him and said, uh, who are you? <laughs> well, you can imagine the blow to Kevin's ego that uh, someone there didn't know the great Kevin Rudd. So he gets worked up and animated about it, saying, who am I? Who am I? Who am and his voice is raising and it's echoing down the corridors of this nursing home. Who am I? And just then, another dear little old ducky came up and said, uh, if you don't know who you are, you just go up to the front desk and they'll tell you. <laughs> Apocryphal, of course, but it's one of those stories in Australian politics that should be true. Should be true and perhaps will be in the future. Now, to answer the question that Ross gets and I get, well, I've got a list here of things that might change your mind about the nature of Australian politics as it's changed mine fundamentally over the last two years. Domestic violence positioned as a debate on patriarchy for the demonisation of men. The so-called mental health epidemic, essentially designed to create identity confusion among young Australians. Safe schools, respectful relationships, greyhounds in New South Wales. Even the Liberal Party are in on the denial of basic freedoms like racing your animals. Uh, QU2A18C Callum Thwaites, the fact that no Labor MP gave any public support to Callum in his circumstances, so-called believers in university education and opportunity, safe spaces, the referendum on safe-sex marriage where it was said we're such a bigoted society if the referen referendum went ahead, the gay community would suicide, that was Bill Shorten's rhetoric, the Human Rights Commission, Bill Leake, Trigg saying that, uh, sadly, we can't regulate speech around the kitchen table. Censorship, the Coopers scandal, A.N. Hersey Alley couldn't even set foot in the country. The red pill. Me? Censorship? I'm on the list. Um, <laughs> the age of oppression. And, and, of course, I come down to the great uh, San Andreas fault line in Australian politics, Donald Trump, who would uh, help you reassess most of your political views. I always say to people, when I joined the... Green Valley branch of the Labor Party in 1979, if you front it up, even if quite possibly you're a billionaire married to Miss World, that, and you said that you're against the foreign policy establishment, who we hated, if you're against the media establishment, who we absolutely hated their guts, you're against Wall Street and you're against the Washington establishment, we would have said, well, you're essentially one of us. 
here in this public housing estate uh, on the edge of, of Sydney. If you're anti-establishment in those four areas, Donald, come on in and sign up to the Green Valley branch of the Labor Party. So, you know, there's a lot of commonality in traditional Labor, anti-establishment, raging against the establishment ideas and campaigning. And uh, this list I read out of all the uh, censorship, the cultural Marxism, the identity politics, the social engineering, if that long list of rapidly changing events and issues in Australian politics doesn't make you fundamentally rethink about the country's future, what would? And of course, on top of that, I find a lot of solace in what Trump's on about from a traditional Labor Party perspective raging against the establishment. But the bigger thing, really, in my um, um, reassessment of these issues, uh, I believe that the, the Labor Party goalposts have moved much more than my position moving. I was elected to the parliament in 1994 at the tail end of the Hawke-Keating period. And at that time, you would have said, well, we're a party of open, liberalised economic markets. Paul Keating always said when he left the parliament in 96 that he got these changes through to open up the Australian economy. It's produced a, a near world record period of economic growth and productivity of which we should all be very grateful uh, as Australians. But Keating said, look, I had to convince these guys, bully these guys, bash these guys in the caucus to get them to believe in a new labour economic model. But when I, leave, when I left, essentially, they reverted to type. They didn't really believe in the open economic markets themselves. And it's true, the thing that happened post-Keating was the rise of the machine man and the apparatchik and the trade union official in the Labor Party caucus. And their method, of course, is economic control, manipulation and a belief in economic planning and so-called industry policy. I mean, if you're a Stephen Smith who'd run the Western Australian Labor Party or a Wayne Swan who'd run the Queensland Labor Party and you're used to bossing everyone around and <coughs> manipulating and organising all the faction and number deals, then you would believe that you could also plan, manipulate and organise the Australian economy. So it's a different mindset to the one Keating had given in government between 83 and 96. So Labor reverted away from the economic model, regrettably. Uh, they very much reverted away from the meritocracy model. I, for many years in the 80s, sat at the feet of Gough Whitlam, who would have argued that the great advance of the age of reason, the great advance of the Western Enlightenment, was meritocracy that coming out of the Middle Ages, you no longer needed to be the son of a feudal lord to get ahead in society. We would judge people not by how they looked or their past role in society or their status. Uh, we would judge them on their individual character, their merit, their work ethic, their contribution to community. And through the provision of civilised services like good schools and universities, people could get ahead on merit. Now, of course, the scandalous thing about identity politics, divisive, primitive identity politics, is that it turns the gains of the Enlightenment upside down. Because we're going back, or the left is going back, to judging people by how they look. Their skin colour, their um, gender, their sexuality, and increasingly their religion. So meritocracy has gone out the window. Whitlam always said to me, the only way you can run the good society is on merit. You can't judge people by skin colour. Whitlam spent 10 years of his life trying to get the Labor Party to stop talking about skin colour under the cover of White Australia. And I've got to say, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, possibly the weirdest thing I'll ever see in my interest in public life, is Sam Dastiari resurrecting skin colour in Labor rhetoric and railing against white men. Now, this is an act of insanity. For anyone in the Labor Party to be talking about skin colour is just an absurdity, a debasement of the principles of meritocracy where people have got to be judged beyond skin colour. The Martin Luther King principle, don't judge me on skin colour, judge me on my character. So to the arguments of our gender and sexuality. Uh, the truth is that left feminism is essentially a very selfish doctrine. It's not about the 98% of women who are in the suburbs and regions wanting better childcare, better opportunities, better education for their children. It's about the 2% at the top of society who want to become politicians, judges or corporate board members. And that's the whole focus of these lunatics, Van Badham, Dee, Madigan, and all these selfish women who want more better jobs for themselves without giving two hoots about the women in the suburbs and regions who've got genuine equity issues on their plate. So anyone who thinks that uh, Labor's now a party of meritocracy needs to rejudge what they're on about and reassess the nature of the modern left of centre movement. 
So they've abandoned meritocracy, and I'm not the only one saying it. The leader of the socialist left faction, one of the great thinkers in Canberra, under the Hawke and Keating governments, was Peter Baldwin. And Peter Baldwin last year, in one of the most important interventions you'll ever see in Australian politics, it was on the Bolt Report, gave a scarifying critique of identity politics. And he made the point we all know to be so true, that when we arrived in the Labor Party in the 70s and 80s, we were told to look through skin colour, gender and sexuality as minor, virtually irrelevant genetic variations between people. Look through them and judge people on their merit and their character and their opportunities in society. So don't think that I've made some uh, uh, transition or um, transformation in my political views. The leader of the Labor socialist left in Canberra in the 80s has made the devastating critique of the tragedy of identity politics. Now, why has Labor gone down this pathway of identity politics in tandem with the Greens and others on the extreme left? Well, it's an unfortunate product of the leftist mindset, which is about control, about manipulation, about trying to transpose, transpose their own values onto the rest of the society. They tried it on economic policy, fell over in the Soviet Union. They've tried it on service provision, a lot of it unsustainable financially. They've tried it on the role of government, trusting government has fallen away. So they've now come down to questions of identity, which play out in terms of feelings and behaviour. And the thing that really sparked this up in Australia was the historic failure of the Rudd-Gillard period. If they'd got away with their open border boat people policy and 1,200 hadn't have drowned, then maybe the left could have been enthused to think, oh, we've manipulated the refugee question to the point where people can sail here on these boats and be settled in Australia. But the fact that it ended so badly with the, uh, the drownings and the death, tragic deaths of people they were trying to help was a catastrophic catastrophic failure. The other failure of that period in terms of identity, of course, was the historic collapse of Julia Gillard's prime ministership. The energy and emotion they pushed behind Australia's first female prime minister, when that came to naught, then all they've had left is to turn to skin colour, gender, sexuality and religion. This is it. This is the last drink saloon for the left in terms of controlling, manipulating and moulding society in their own image. They're down to feelings, behaviour, language, PC, the whole box and dice of cultural Marxism that we've seen rapidly move through Australian institutions over the last couple of years. And with that, of course, you've got this new segregationist agenda. I used to, uh, and I still believe in, communitarian politics as practised by people like Amitai Etzioni, where you can't separate people uh, and expect them to then cooperate and entrust the state with certain responsibilities. You need people to have a sense of common purpose and common cause and common values, building social cooperation before they'll then delegate to the state certain funding and spending responsibilities. Now, a lot of this identity stuff is inherently segregationist. I mean, we've talked about Callum and the problem he had at Queensland University of Technology, and it was A-D-C, but it's often forgotten. It was a product of a safe space that segregated black Australian students from white Australian students. Now, I'll be buggered if I know how you get Indigenous reconciliation in this country. If white students can't sit at a computer desk next to Aboriginal students, make friends, build cooperation, talk about their shared interests and past, now, that's what Indigenous reconciliation is supposed to achieve. Kicking white people out of a computer lab is anti the principles of reconciliation and, and of course, the wacky stuff you hear about cultural appropriation from the likes of Yasmin abdel Magid that's against the principles of multiculturalism in Australia. So a lot of this stuff is, is the exploding cigar, it's the own gold. You know, um, it's like that South, Australia, uh, South American guy kicked the own gold, he went back and the drug cartels killed him. Well, the truth is modern Labor is killing itself with the own goal of identity politics based on separatism and segregation. Now, whatever you think of me, I've got an IQ that's in triple figures and I'm not going to fall for this bullshit. I'm not going to fall for this bullshit and support it in any shape or form. I'm not going to support the end of meritocracy. I'm not going to support superstitions like unconscious bias. I'm not going to be like Martin Parkinson saying, I've lost control of my faculties and really don't know what sort of judgments I'm making about people. I live in the age of reason. We all live in the age of rationality. And we're not going to go back to the Middle Ages. We're not going to wipe the gains of the entitlement based on nonsense like unconscious bias. 
So we're not going to judge people by how they look. We're not going to fall for superstitions, middle-aged, medieval superstitions like unconscious bias. And we're not going to go back to the Middle Ages on censorship. Well, you can't say things that are uh, disagreeable, the things that, that people might find, um, uh, in which people might find disagreement. The truth is to learn in the age of enlightenment, enlightenment, you need to be challenged in your ideas. If you hear a different opinion, someone who's got a different outlook to yours, it challenges you and allows you to learn, improve your own rhetoric, your response makes you think. This is what we used to call education. But the modern left closed it down in the name of censorship. And just last weekend, I watched the Red Pill movie for the first time, this dreadful thing where men speak. Men speak about issues like male suicide and unemployment and restructuring and manufacturing. And quite frankly, by the end of the two hours of it, I thought it was pretty dull. It was, in effect, the red pill, the type of conversation you get in any Australian pub, any Australian cafe, any Australian restaurant or community group talking about the disadvantage, some of the disadvantages of the modern man. And of course, the left feminists from the sociology departments also had their say in the movie. And if you go and watch it yourself, you'll find that this is the ultimate state statement of how we live in the age of the oppression of free speech, that a movie like that is to be banned at Sydney University and Dendi and other uh, hysterical people have said that the public can't watch uh, information that's already common in the streets and neighbourhoods and town centres of the nation. Because at the end of the day, the left in their determination to make sure we're all like them, don't trust anyone except themselves. The whole thing about free speech is let people decide. I trust a gathering like this, I trust people in the, I communicate with in the media, I trust people in my own community, that they don't, if they don't agree with me, they can listen to an alternative point of view and make up their own mind about what's valid. So ultimately you need to trust in the public. And the one thing about being at a libertarian conference, of course, is there is trust in people digesting differences of opinion, different information, reaching their own conclusions about truth. The other good thing about a libertarian conference and I really appreciate it, given my experiences in recent time. No matter what you say, you can't kick me out. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you can introduce me if you really feel inclined. Um, Mrs Ross. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just want to check, do we have any, uh, do we have any Fairfax media <laughs> present? We've got a, any Fairfax photographer? We've got a Fairfax person over here. Okay. Um, have we got a Fairfax photographer? Okay, yeah. So, um, and w what was your name, mate? Sorry? The Fairfax photographer's job. Yeah, everybody's got an, a mobile phone. I want you to punch in Ross Cameron images right now. Have a look. And you will meet the Fairfax photographer. And uh, his job on a Sunday afternoon is to come to UTS Aerial Hall, try to take 100 photographs of Ross Cameron and Mark Latham and make them look like fuckwits. <laughs> That is his task. Now, if you want to come down, if you want, last time, on the, about the 45th, they got the Nazi salute from Ross Cameron in full flight, right? Front page, Sydney Morning Herald. Ross Cameron signed up to the National Socialist Party. Um, this is what Rush, uh, Rush, the Herald actually wrote a report about the conference. Nick O'Malley came down. Uh, his task is write a column which makes all of you look like fuckwits. Um, you know, get as many scary words in there as you possibly can, you know. David Lionhelm talking about shooting guns, you know, get that prominent, you know, get up there. So you can get a photo of David Lionhelm doing this to someone. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's journalism. Yeah. Rush Limbaugh calls it the drive-by media. He says, you know, the modern media 
I like, they're really like the uh, morality police in Indonesia, in the Indonesian villages. They go around with these bamboo canes, you know, and uh, if they find a man and a woman, as they did last week, sitting alone together in a guest room, they should be beaten with a bamboo cane. And the question, uh, you know, the interesting, the serious question arising is, you know, where does this impulse come from to control other people's behaviour, you know, to enforce the norms of correctness? <laughs> um, mate, if you want to come down now, I'll give you the Nazi salute. You can fuck off to the pub, you know. Um, <clears throat> John Allegro is uh, was a British archaeologist and uh, scholar, linguist, ancient linguist, and he was one of the five who were given a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls to translate. And he became quite controversial, quite a controversial academic, brilliant. Uh, he wrote a book which is described as the least academic uh, book ever written by an eminent scholar which was called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. And he makes an argument that the early Judaic and Semitic uh, religions grew out of the fertility cults of the Near East, of the mushroom in particular. And, uh, but he talks about, if you look up John Allegro on uh, YouTube, you, you can see a video. And he's in his sort of tweed jacket with the leather. You know, he's your classic English don. Uh, Cambridge, um, hugely eminent. And he said his view was that about two million years ago, the Homo sapien, bipedal Homo sapien, kind of looked up in this hostile world where he was subject to, you know, the, the saber toothed lion, uh, to famine, to disease, to lightning strike a life expectancy of probably no more than 30. And we found even in, the, in ancient Rome, we have a life expectancy of 25. Now, many people, uh, I mean, Seneca was drunk the hemlock at 70. Many people in the ancient world lived to old age, but most, so many died in childbirth and in childhood. But if you could get through to sort of teenage years, you could last. But, Allegro's argument was that the Homo sapiens sort of looked up and looked around as the only upright species and felt a sense of insecurity, a sense of vulnerability and a sense of isolation. And that that sense of isolation has, was the thing that drove the Homo sapien to conceive of God um, as, a, as someone to walk upright with in, in the world. And interestingly, if you talk about Socrates, he was eventually convicted of two offences. One was corrupting the, the morals of the youth of Athens, and the second one was worshipping false gods, of worshipping the gods of foreign cities. And what we often find is that there is this very, very strong impulse in the human out of this kind of insecurity to set up our local religion and to demand compliance with that God. And uh, really, I mean, we've just seen, um, you know, uh, Sharuf, uh, the Australian, uh, thought to have been uh, killed in, uh, in Syria fighting for Islamic State. He's just taken his Australian son, uh, given him a uh, semi-automatic weapon and, and, and play-acted through him how he would murder uh, Australians if he was doing his religious duty. And there's a sense in which what is going on there um, is really not that different to what is happening with the morality police carrying the bamboo cane in the villages of Arche, or indeed uh, the Sydney Morning Herald and the drive-by media in Australia 
uh, which wants to rush around. It's like the Sydney Morning Herald and Huffington Post and, you know, uh, they, they get on their Harleys in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, strap on like something out of Mad Max and they're sort of going down a highway looking for their next victim, you know, to shoot them up. If you deviate by one degree from the orthodoxy of our local religion. And in our case, I would say the dominant paradigm of the left, the dominant religion, uh, Camille Paglia, the... Uh, the, what's her name? The uh, feminist, uh, anti-feminist Paglia, who's quite brilliant, magnificent. Uh, she talks about with the death of sort of um, theism, there is this kind of vacuum in this post-Christian world which the progressive left wishes to fill with a new set of taboos, a new set of uh, rules from which we must not deviate, a new set of orthodox opinion to which you must subscribe. And in Australia that would be, you know, probably gay marriage is at the top of the list, um, climate change is, you know, somewhere in there, uh, asylum seekers, borderless worlds, you know, next up. The big state. We love the big state. You know? <laughs> Sydney Morning Herald has never seen a new tax it does not like, right? <laughs> it's like this, this infant child, you know. Shakespeare talks about the seven ages of man, the infant mewling and puking in its mother's arms. And you've got the Sydney Morning Herald there with its lips pursed, you know, its mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's this fear. There's this fear, this childlike, ancient, human fear of the unknown. This desperate desire to believe in the beneficent paternal state which is here to care for your every need and problem. And you must subscribe to this religion uh, if you wish to be embraced as a member of the orthodox establishment. And indeed, uh, you know, Graver uh, talked about this a little bit last night. What do you do about it? In fact, Andrew Cooper, the uh, Liberty Works Award winner, asked a very, very interesting question. What, it seems like we establish the think tanks, you know, we get together, but no matter what we do, no matter whether the Liberal Party goes in or the Labor Party goes in, a uh, mate of mine's just built a house out in, uh, in, uh, near Dural, and he says, I've got like 11 out of 14 members of the local council are Liberals. I've got a state Liberal Premier and I've got a federal Liberal Prime Minister, uh, but I need a master's degree just to get through the regulation involved in building a house in Dural. You know, I need a full-time permanent study of the 72 different rules required to install a water tank in my backyard. Um, this impulse, OK, of the insecure human to create a new god uh, and then to divide the world into those who are compliant and those who are non-compliant. Um, Saul Alinsky, the, who wrote, uh, who is really the kind of spiritual father of the Chicago, Obama, uh, you know, uh, weather underground uh, left, who wrote the rules for radicals. And uh, I wish... Uh, my phone hadn't just run out of battery, I would, have, I would have read one to you. But essentially what Alinsky says is what you must do is always attack the individual rather than an institution because individuals hurt faster. Okay? So that's what, you know, our mate, God bless him, from the Sydney Morning Herald, his objective, uh, the individual hurts faster. And so what you must do is you must polarise and you must isolate. And so what you are seeing, you know, with me and, uh, and Mark is this absolutely determined effort by the establishment to make us inhuman. That's the, the goal. The good news uh, is the lesson that Donald Trump tells us is that the mainstream media has been thoroughly busted. 
Uh, the mainstream media has been found out. The mainstream media, um, you know, I mean, ha has been discovered to be incapable of destroying Donald Trump. No matter how hard, there's probably, you know, very few modern figures who have been subject to the destruction campaign. Whatever, you th whatever Trump's weaknesses, flaws and strengths, I mean, the guy is resilient because ordinary citizens have now figured out that uh, this is not actually journalism. This is a religious cult. Uh, this is a uh, morality police carrying the bamboo cane. And uh, the thing that uh, everyone in this room uh, shares, uh, who isn't being paid to enforce the religion, uh, is, is, is the kind of exhilarating pleasure of being a free human being, of being able to make your own decisions, uh, of, like Marcus Aurelius, the thing that distinguishes us from the other primates is the capacity for reason, the capacity to study a phenomena on its own merits, not to bring to it a pre-packaged commitment to a set of religious objectives uh, which must be uh, ticked or crossed uh, in, in every case. And I guess I'd just like to say, uh, as, as you know, this, this great uh, conclave draws to a conclusion, um, you know, we, uh, Mark and I, are described as, uh, and happily describe ourselves as outsiders. But this is just a moment in history in which we happen to find ourselves. If you were a Carthaginian in 600 BC in the Mediterranean, uh, you may well have been under pressure to engage in child sacrifice. Indeed, throughout much of the ancient world, uh, child sacrifice was very enthusiastically practised. Uh, we find today in India, you know, there are, there are states of India in which the birth rate for girls is 0.8 of the birth rate for boys. Uh, so India and indeed uh, in parts of China, Likewise, there's an intense cultural prejudice against the female. And what you see is a level of child sacrifice taking place in the modern world that absolutely matches uh, the numbers in the ancient world because of an entrenched perception about uh, the female in those cultures. Now, we don't find the progressive left in Australia doesn't give a flying fuck about those females because they don't fit into our local religion. And uh, I just want to say that it is perhaps, it's, it's lovely, it's nice to be, um, you know, to be popular, uh, to be loved. Um, I just got expelled from my political party, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, Marcus Aurelius would say that we should do our duty with cheerfulness because there are many who go through their whole lives without ever doing their duty. And if you have the opportunity to do so, you should do it with pleasure, with alacrity. And uh, I am um, full of hope, um, but uh, completely realistic. Marx has really said, you ought not to be surprised when a fig tree produces Figs. Okay. You ought not to be surprised uh, when our friend from the Sydney Morning Herald writes a story tomorrow that shit cans liberty. Okay. Um, but you ought to uh, continue to do your duty as an upright homo sapien with reason uh, because this is an unbelievable privilege. And the last thing I will say to you is that both uh, the ancient world had a, much, had, had, a, had a much deeper insight into time, I believe, uh, than we do. The average Australian consults their mobile phone 160 times a day, OK? We are absolutely into this instantaneous response, electronic stimulus sort of deal. It's actually, I think, it's one of the reasons causing this uh, wave of depression among young Australians. But uh, Marcus Aurelius said, you have to understand your life in the context of the vast abyss of time stretching back in history 
until before the creation of the universe, and indeed the vast abyss on the other side of your life, to which this earth and this universe will go, um, you know, in, in all likelihood without humans. Uh, if, uh, you know, if our propensity for self-destruction uh, is, any, uh, is any indication. So um, this, is, this is a brief moment, a brief moment, a flash, an instant. It's the only moment we have. And uh, so um, I don't think you could spend it any better way than being uh, right here today. And uh, I just conclude by saying that uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Liberty Works. I was delighted to see them publish uh, Stephen Cates's uh, blog on the Trump campaign. But if I were being really honest about the person who has been doing the most heavy lifting in the cause of liberty in the last 12 months, I would say, without hesitation, in Australia, that person is Mark Latham. And uh, I'm delighted to share the stage with him. Thanks very much.